today, you really can't find any positive articles about multifamily, but you can find plenty of negative articles, right? As a syndicator, an investor, a data scientist, it behooves me to know who are the richest people in America, because my company will grow faster if I understand who the richest people in America are. There are four things that appear to benefit from inflation the most in, in the, the United States, because these are the most uh, inflexible of all things. These are inflexible demands. When I look at what overperforms on a whole, these four things overperform. If I were to ask you this question, is today a better time to buy than 18 months ago? There's actually only one answer. It has to be a better time. Well, hello, hello. This is Prashant Kumar and Paul Sr. from Cashflow Champs on Cashflow Champs Real Estate Podcast. Today, we have an esteemed guest, my first mentor, Neil Bauer. Neil Bauer is the CEO of CEO and founder of You Grow and Grow Capitals, two commercial real estate investment companies. Neil's, Neil's companies use cutting-edge real estate analytics technology to source and acquire or build large commercial properties across the United States for nearly 800 investors. His portfolio over is over 400, 1,400 units with an asset AUM value of over a billion dollars. I can talk a lot about Neil. He, he shares his team's unique and cutting edge real estate data methodology to connect with geeks and nerdy investors who share his vision. The data beats gut feel by a million miles. Over yes. 10,000 real estate investors have taken his free real estate data analytic course on Udemy. And the course has over 1,000 five-star reviews. He speaks at dozens of real estate conferences across the country and virtually on the internet. Today he's with us on this podcast. He has over 5,000 investors attending his multifamily webinar series each year and hundreds have attended his Magic of Multifamily Bootcamp, including myself personally in the beginning of my career about five years ago. His Facebook and meetup groups have tens of thousands of investors. Neil, we are so excited to have you today here with us. So honored you have spoken on our, our conferences, virtual conferences. And as you said, today morning already, you have already been interviewed by multiple people. So we are, we are honored to have you here today. Thank you. Um, I think the honor is all mine. Um, it is so pleasing for me to see folks that you know came into the boot camp a number of years ago go on to become syndicators in the industry. I'm uh, very proud to note that many of my students now have portfolios larger than mine, which means that they had amazing skill sets that they executed on um, and just needed a push from me, just needed the knowledge, just needed the initial push and have gone on to have these magnificent portfolios that I feel very proud of, you know, and being part of the ecosystem is terrific. And that's what you're doing. That's what Paul is doing. You're, you're contributing to the knowledge of the ecosystem. And so uh, I'm very privileged to be here. So today floor is yours, Neil. We are going to just discuss, you know, what was, what has been your unique background in past mm -hmm. and what do you see the future going, uh, how the, what the future holds. I think we are all Worried. I mean, this is a very timely interview. We are all worried about the future. So let's start with your unique background. Tell us something unique about your background, uh, which uh, people, you know, know or, or or want to hear from you. Sure. I, I'm, you know, I I was I was born slightly autistic. Something that my family worked on. Um, you know, over time, and and some of those autism um, characteristics sort of diminished. But um, I have had a love for numbers um, throughout my life. Life. I see numbers in everything. I see numbers when I'm walking in the morning with my wife. I'm counting the number of steps that I'm taking, looking at how many trees, uh, you know, my mind asks questions like, how could we calculate the number of leaves in this tree that's coming up? Or what is the number of square, you know, feet from my house to the temple that we walk to? Uh, that's the kind of mind that I have. And so I, I look at everything in the world in terms of numbers. This isn't a heartless way of looking at things. It's actually a very interesting and fun way of looking at the world. And sometimes it's very annoying when I'm trying to get to sleep, uh, but that's the way I look at everything. And so I'm quantifying everything in the industry. And the, right now, this the multifamily industry is actually a very fascinating place to quantify 
because uh, of the over bullishness in the industry from 2021 and, and also from 2022. And so we're seeing the results of that over bullishness combined with some bad luck. And, and so it's fascinating to look at it and sort of project what will the multifamily industry look like a year or two years and three years out. And so my mind's very active around that question on an ongoing basis. You know, Neil, that's awesome, man. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I also want to add my voice to that and what you just shared just now. And uh, of all the different industries, I mean, there are different industries that have numbers and whatever, just to kind of work and fit with your mind frame that you were blessed with an awesome mind when it comes to analytics and stuff like that. Um, eventually, you 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 gravitated and settled pretty much on multifamily real estate. Um, uh, what attracted you there, Neil? I think... Um... Taxation benefits is really the first place to start. What what I saw was that, you know, I was fairly wealthy. I'd already sold my technology company. And the taxation benefits that I see in real estate, I've only ever seen those kinds of benefits in one other asset class, and that is oil and gas. And what I'm finding is that the best year of oil and gas years of oil and gas are behind them because while it remains a very potent and profitable industry. Um, you know, the, the benefits that you get in oil and gas for, for uh, you know, for taxes are mostly on new, um, you know, new wells. And we're not just digging as many new wells as we were before, because most of the new energy in the world, almost half of it is renewable energy, right? Um, and so because renewable becomes an, a bigger and bigger portion, those taxation benefits are going to wane away. And I see more money actually flowing into real estate over the next 10 or 20 years as some of those benefits go away. Um, so taxation just is not something that investors fully understand. You know, in my mind, I'm always doing the math on post-tax, post-tax benefit, post-tax math, right? And and sometimes 10% uh, on a pre, you know, a post-tax basis is more than 14% on a pre-tax basis, especially if you live in high tax states like California or New York, or you're a high tax person such as a doctor or a lawyer, right? So people that are earning a lot of money. And most of the money that's coming into syndication is coming from those people, is coming from people that are living in high tax states or are uh, have high tax jobs. So I think taxation really is the first thing. The second piece of it is that when I look at data for the last 70 to 80 years, we know the fundamental way to say this is this. There are four things that appear to benefit from inflation the most in, in the, the United States, because these are the most uh, inflexible of all things. These are inflexible demands. Before we continue, let me take 60 seconds to tell you about Multifamily University. Are you ready to take your real estate investing to the next level? Look no further than Multifamily University. Our comprehensive resources, including guest podcast appearances, educational webinars, the Real Estate Trends Toolkit, and the Location Magic course are all designed to make smart investing easy and accessible. Plus, with no subscriptions, no upsells, you can trust that we're always looking out for your best interests. But don't take our word for it. Check out what our satisfied customer, Carlos M., had to say. Neil's presentation was filled with invaluable information that is not readily available to the average investor. This group takes you to the elite level of investing. Join the ranks of the elite with Multifamily University. Join us at multifamilyu.com and start investing from a place of knowledge today. Not only will you have access to a wealth of knowledge from industry experts, but you'll also be able to stay ahead of the game with our in-depth analysis of market trends and potential recessions or corrections. Invest with confidence and make informed decisions based on data, not gut feel. Don't miss out. Visit us at multifamilyu.com today or click the link in the description below. And now back to the content. So, you know, there's food, there's rent, right? There's oil and there's healthcare. So when I look right. at the last 70 or 80 years, when I look at what overperforms on a whole, these four things overperform. As Americans, we everyone says inflation's high right now. But if you ask knowledgeable Americans, you know, what is typical inflation in the last 15 years? The most common answer you'll get is 2%. Then you ask them, okay, what is rent growth over the last two, you know, 15 years? Less people know the answer, but the right answer is potentially two to three times inflation during that time frame. If you ask them about healthcare, the answer is five times inflation. So you notice that some areas are extremely inflexible. People just need to rent. People need healthcare. People need food. 
and the things that we need the most appear to stay well, 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 well above inflation. And you can go back and look at the last 10 years, the last 20 years, or the last 50 years, and you'll notice rents beat inflation by a very large margin. And the only time in, our, in, the, in that time frame that rents have been negative has been 2009. One sing, single year, even though the real estate crisis went from 2008 to 2013. So when I, my mind will just not let go of this. This seems like a very simple thing to say, but it's extraordinarily powerful. So anytime you have an asset class or an industry which tends to beat inflation by a very, very long way, you're always growing your wealth. You're growing it through bad times and good times because what you're essentially doing is the, the, bad, the, the bad times and the good times even out. For example, rent growth in the last 12 months in the United States was zero. Well, that sounds really bad because inflation was 5% or 6%, depending upon who you ask. And you're like, oh my, you would expect rent growth to be six or 7%. Yes, look at the last two years. Well, over the last two years, rent growth in the United States has been 17%. And inflation in the United States over the last two years has been nine. So the bad times, and the good times even out. Math on a one-year basis is terrible. Math, on a math, math even on a five-year basis sometimes is terrible. But when I look at it, at any five-year time frame over the last 50, the growth in rents is absolutely astonishing. And so it gives me an unfair advantage over any other kind of business that is not in the oil, healthcare, food, or rent business. We have an unfair advantage over the 10,000 other industries. That's what keeps me in real estate, unfair advantages. That's awesome, that's awesome. And so I think you, you, you take the onus upon you to, to inform others about it. That's why you give the opportunity in terms of uh, probably limited investors or partners can come into your deal. You can share, cause the average doctors or lawyers probably don't think about that, right? But uh, probably it's up on us to kind of share this information with them so that they can take full advantage uh, of uh, what you just discussed here. And it looks like uh, that's something that you've uh, done very well over your career so far, Neil. I, I, I'm curious, I'm always curious Every day, my mind dreams up hundreds of new questions. And I basically used to ask Google those questions or ask my employees to research. These days, I ask ChatGPT, I get a better response. Um, but like this morning, I asked myself a question and, and I'm, I'm going to apologize for those that I might you know, rub the wrong way. As a, as a syndicator, an investor, a data scientist, it behooves me to know who are the richest people in America because my company will grow faster if I understand who the richest people in America are. So the question I asked myself this morning while I was doing Pilates at you know six o'clock in the morning is, what American ethnicities are the richest, right? And how do they rank up against white people, right? 60%, 59.6% of Americans are whites, right? About 13% are African-American. And then the rest are basically some other ethnicity. So I was curious and I uh, when I'm curious about a question, I first make a guess and then I go out and get the data, right? So the answer to that question was interesting and surprising. So I would have thought that Chinese Americans would be you know, significantly richer. I was looking at incomes. So I, I could look at net worth, but income data is much more readily available. So I was like, probably the richest people in America have got to be the white people and the Chinese. Well, actually, as it turns out, here's the data. Of all the ethnicities in America, the whites are at $77,000 in income average, right? The Chinese are lower, they're at 70. The Filipinos, which is completely surprising, were at 80. And then there's a bunch of ethnicities that are very low, like um, Bangladeshis or you know Burmese. Burmese are in the 30s. And there's a whole bunch of other ethnicities that are there. But the ethnicity that was an absolute surprise, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, was the Indians. So everyone's in a cluster between 60 and $80,000 in income. Then there's a massive gap and the Indians are above 100,000, right? So the Indians are actually the alpha community of the United States, you know, much, much richer than the whites, much rich, richer than the blacks, where, where the, the blacks are in the, in the 40s and 50s range. And this data is useful. And people are like, should you be uh, profiling communities? Why not? Everyone does it. It's completely legal to say that if there's a community that's extraordinarily rich and is interested in real estate, we should go after them. It sort of makes sense, especially to Prashant, right? But it may not be as intuitive that the Indians are that much richer than white people and the Chinese, right? And so 
how am I going to use this data? Well, after I return from my Pilates, after I Google this, this there's a chart on the internet, it's very nice. Um, I gave instructions to my team to say, change our Facebook ads to be more biased in favor of Indians. And that would increase the number of people that we would be getting in through our funnel that might be interested. You see what I mean? So I think people don't think about these questions all the time. They have an intuitive feel for certain questions. But I think what gets us ahead, what gets you ahead and me ahead, is we're continuously delving deep into the data and saying, which of these insights could lead to more profit? In this case, the profit would be for my company, so not for my investors. But imagine if I apply thousands and thousands of such insights over the years, the majority of the benefit is going to end up going to investors. So basically what, what you are saying, Neil, is that uh, investors, I mean, Indians are actually the alpha community. You know, they are beyond beyond a normal white American and beyond Chinese. Well, no, no, they're far beyond, right? So everyone is in one cluster, the Chinese, the white, the white Americans, the Filipinos, and the Japanese are in one cluster. Then there's a massive gap, and there's only one ethnicity after that, and that's the Indians. And why, why do you think, I mean, why do you think, what is the reason? I mean, I want to go deep. The H-1B visa, the vast majority of the people that come on the H-1B visa are Indians, not Chinese. So I think that's the big reason. I mean, the, the, basically, we're selected for our capabilities, enter the company legally, right? As you can ima uh, imagine, a significant portion of the Mexican population enters illegally. And a lot of those people that enter simply can't work in regular jobs because you know they don't have legal status. So that community ends up being on the lower end of the scale. Indians enter legally. And, and so we're self-selecting for success. And, and, and you know it's just an example of data, right? I could give you a hundred examples like this. What I'm trying to point out, because this is what Paul said, yeah. if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, you don't have the time to ask these questions and figure it out. It's our job as syndicators to figure out the answers to these, right? I've been curious about cities in the United States. And so the course that Prashant mentioned, you know, 12,000 students are taking it right now, has about a thousand five-star reviews, is a course of my question on which cities in the United States are the best for real estate and what really matters? What are the things that move the needle? I'm sure that's a question that other people have thought about, but have they had the time to go look at those things? Right. So the, the answer in 2020 was Idaho Falls, Idaho. Well, I can tell you if I asked a thousand people on the street, not a single person would have answered that question correctly. Right. So data beats gut feel by a million miles, it, it, by a million miles. And I think that as we continue as an industry to grow and syndication, multifamily syndication is an extremely immature industry because the Jobs Act passed in 2014. And the vast majority of syndications have been done since 2014. So we're talking about an industry that's really eight years old. Right. And, and so we're not even you know, teenagers yet. So as we grow and as we learn, we are, we are going to bring more value to our investors. And the industry is now facing its first crisis, right? So this is, you know, the crisis started about 12 months ago and it's worsening every month. And that will make us more resilient and offer greater value to our investors. So what do you think where, where the investor's mindset is going, especially after very recent events, you know, World Wall Street Journal uh, article, you know, Houston foreclosure and, and some of the events that has happened, you know, what do you think where the investor sentiments are and and how do we, what in your opinion, how should uh, syndicators or even LP investors navigate through those challenges? Honestly, investors are making the same exact mistakes that they're made, made in 2008, 2009. So from what I am seeing, limited partner investors have a hoard mentality. They tend to follow the hoard. Um, and so today, you really can't find any positive articles about multifamily, but you can find plenty of negative articles, right? Just the, the Houston $200 million portfolio generated hundreds of you know, negative articles, and now the Wall Street Journal um, you know, negative article. And that creates a hoard mentality. The question that investors should be asking themselves is, so you as an investor, and you consider yourself an investor, not a speculator, were willing to make investments into properties that cost 20 to 30% more 18 months ago with assumptions that have since proven to be wrong. And therefore those properties have fallen in value by 20%, some even 30 in certain markets. And over that time though, Either net operating income of the industry has stayed the same or gone up. Most markets have gone up. Some have stayed the same. 
So as an investor and not a speculator, if I were to ask you this question, is today a better time to buy than 18 months ago? There's actually only one answer. It has to be a better time. It absolutely has to be a better time because you are an investor, you're buying into a business, that business's income has stayed the same or gone up, but its price has come down 25%. Therefore, buying it today is vastly more profitable than buying it 18 months ago. But I don't see investors reacting that way because of the hoard mentality, because of the, oh, things went wrong in the last 18 months, therefore I shouldn't be buying today. But aren't these the same investors that go to every cocktail party and say, do what, you know, they repeat the famous words of Warren Buffett, which are that, you know, when others are fearful, be greedy. When others are greedy, be fearful, right? Today's the time when others are fearful. Isn't this the time to be greedy? Isn't Warren Buffett being greedy at this point in time? So what, what we continue to see investors quote these wonderful things from superstar, brilliant people like Warren Buffett, but not actually follow those instructions. The, what I would challenge you is this. Why would you not buy something that hasn't lost any of its shine, any of its beauty, any of its need, any of its fundamentals, but is just a lot cheaper, right? I think contrarianism is required at this point in time to fully understand the industry. And I don't think enough investors are doing that. And that's a little sad, right? And some of those investors are simply saying, yeah, but the syndicator should have known this 18 months ago. The short answer is, had nothing to do with syndicators. Syndicators, every, every business, every single business in the United States made the same assumption that the syndicators did, which is interest rates will stay low. And so you look at value of tech stocks, value of prop techs. Prop techs are down 80 to 90%. Technic tech stocks are down 20 to 30%. They rose a lot in the last two weeks, so I'll discount that because of the upcoming artificial intelligence explosion. But if you cancel out the last few weeks, I mean, tech stocks are down. Um, cars are down, right? So you look at any industry across the world and say, who was smart enough to make the assumptions that interest rates are, are going to not rise? And I think you're really going to struggle. You're going to have to find a company out of a thousand, right? So the way that business worked in 2021 is everyone was forced to make those assumptions. And that is an indication of the cycle. Now, having said that, there were some people that did less of it, some people that did more. So my, a lot of my students bought eight properties in that uh, late 2020 to uh, mid 2022 you know, range. I bought one and bought back another one that I really liked from my partners. So I'll count it as one and a half because, and, and even with that one and a half, one of those properties was actually purchased at a five cap in a military town, which most people don't like. They don't like buying in a military town. But my, my reaction was, I think this should be a five cap market. Everyone else is buying a three and a half cap. The, the price difference in a military market is so much that the risk is now lower of buying at five cap in a military market than of buying three and a half cap in a, a, a major market like Phoenix. And I proven to be right, even though my property has had two, it has taken two hits from two times the United States send, uh, you, know, um, you know, armed forces out, not to Ukraine, but they, they're sending them to Poland, which is the next country over. So twice my property went from 96% occupancy to 85% occupancy. But it was able to accept those hits, move ahead, and still be more profitable than most other properties because I it was cheap. I bought it for five cap where everyone else was buying it for three and a half. Just for you, people who don't know, the lower the cap rate, the higher the price. So when you're buying a property for three and a half cap, you're paying a lot more than five. So I made that decision not to buy a lot of properties during that time. And it was very painful. I was jealous of my own students. It's like everyone's buying a property every quarter and I'm not even buying one every year. So I'm human. I was jealous. I was annoyed. I was banging my head on the wall, but now I'm feeling a little bit better about it. Awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, I, I could, a lot of sentiments that you spoke of, Neil, because, um, you know, right now, you know, we're, we're starting to buy now. We haven't bought in a, in a while for the past nine months. We really, we didn't really good. buy in a property. And now we have something on a contract, a 506C property going to close in, on it in the next two to three weeks, beautiful uh, asset in Atlanta, MSA. And, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking the same thing. Now is the time that we got to take advantage of what's going on. I think 
the PR on that article in some way just reflected one side of the article, right? And, and, and rub it in a negative way. But we have, I think we have the onus is on us. And also um, we have to um, get, get the word out there that this is really a good time to invest in multifamily real estate because this is probably one of the, you know, the best times we've seen where the property prices are at least a little bit, you know, you can get in there and you can get property at decent prices and you can make monies on your investments uh, going forward. So as far as your concern, um, is it now the time you think you're gonna be a little more aggressive in terms of uh, building up a portfolio based on what the, the, the market conditions are like now? Yes, and I'm going to get more aggressive with each month. So what is happening right now is prices, let's say a property's value is $30 million. Well, we are still continuing to see its value drop by between half a percent and 1% a month. So half a percent a month would be $150,000 drop. 1% would be 300,000. In recent months, it's slowing. So it's more on the half a percent side than on the 1% side as cap rates continue to um, uncompress. I've never been a believer in waiting to time the market. I have never succeeded in timing the stock market and I've never succeeded in my timing the real estate market. I believe in what, what is known as dollar cost averaging. It's a stock market concept, but basically what this says is as prices fall, buy, and as they continue to fall, continue to buy. So you will, by doing so, you will always have one property or more at the absolute lowest price and every other property at a low, but not lowest price. And then you might have one, a couple of properties that you also buy on the up curve. When you average these across, you are very close to the bottom. Dollar cost averaging is, is a fantastic concept and idea because it prevents paralysis. Clearly prices have dropped by 20% in some markets more, some markets a little less. So now, when you're on that downward curve and no one can dispute, no investor can dispute that you're not on that curve, it makes right. sense to continue buy and, and, and buying in dollar cost averaging. When do I think I'll be the most aggressive? It'll be Q1 of next year. So I, I believe that the bottom uh, price in this cycle is going to be Q1 of next year. The peak of this cycle was 2021 Q1. So the peak to the bottom is 24 months or two years. Awesome, awesome. Do you find your investors being a little more reluctant uh, in investing, probably because of the negative PR that's out there, or do you still have a good investor base who is with you and, 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 and get on your deals uh, as you start looking in, into buying more assets uh, going forward? I, I find them to be a lot more reluctant. I, and I think this really has to go down with it really has to go to paralysis, the concept of paralysis. If you continue to hear bad news and nothing but bad news, it takes away your ability to be rational, right? It takes, it chips away at your ability to be rational about this, right? So how is the situation today different from what happened in 2008? In 2008, single family prices fell 29%. But even after they fell 20%, and you bought after they fell 20%, you would have been very lucky today. You would have been very happy. Who cares about the fact that you bought at 20, 20 down versus 29% down, right? And certain markets fell even more than that. Point is, once prices drop a certain percentage, you're in a good place. And that's really investing is all about being in a good place. So we are in a good place today. And our job is to convince our investors that that is true. So that that brings the most important question of the day is what are we supposed to do or what are you doing to keep convincing your investors to continue to believe in what you are doing? You know, it's a psychological question. What is that we, we can do, you know, to, to have that uh, confidence, investors' confidence back so that they are ready when we have the deal? Messaging. I'm spending a lot of time with my investors. So obviously, this podcast is about not about my investors, right? But um, next Thursday, um, I have an event which will have about 2,000 people registering. And that event's title is about the crisis, coming crisis in multifamily and the coming crisis in commercial real estate. And you know, since you guys are on my drip campaign, you can probably see what it looks like. And so I'll go in and I'll explain what has happened in the last two years, sort of like I did in this podcast with some charts and graphs and things like that. And then I'll basically 
point out that this is that's what creates the opportunity. When everything is perfect, like it was in early 2021, there is really no opportunity because the mar market is priced for perfection, right? So the only time when opportunity exists is when the market is not priced, is when the market has challenges. That is actually the only time when you get this benefit. And it's extraordinarily clear if you look at the data that we are, in, we are either in that time or we are entering that time, depending upon how you look at the data. So one could say, yeah, you know, by next quarter, we should be there. But I don't think anyone can say the opportunity is still one to two years away because that makes zero sense given that the Fed has, is very clearly indicating that they have plateaued um, on, on interest rate hikes and probably will start to drop towards the end of the year. So I think the data is extremely supportive you as a syndicator should be talking with your investors twice or three times as often as you were a year ago, because a year ago, you didn't need to talk with them because they were hearing good news. Now you need to talk with them because they're, all they're hearing is bad news. That is awesome. That is super awesome. That's a super awesome tip for a lot of, lot of syndicators, a lot of investors you know, to continue to keep their motivation up. Yep. Uh, uh, so, so basically, basically, in terms of the marketing, I mean, I know you are doing a webinar uh, a week from now, and I don't know whether this podcast will be released by then. But in terms of marketing, what are the steps? What are the other steps that you would take uh, to to spread this message that you know there are still good times to come, guys? Please remain ready. You know, whether it is six weeks from now or six months from now, um, you know. What are the other messages that you are sharing with, with, the, with the industry? Um, any any deck that I have for any project, any you know property, any raise needs to continuously point out two extremely important data points. Number one, that the gap between the average mortgage and the average rents is the largest in history, right? And it's massively accelerated after COVID, one, because home prices went up. I know they've come down a very tiny bit, but that they, they went up a massive amount. So coming down a very tiny bit is really not going to make much of a dent. But what happened is interest rates doubled, right? Interest rates today are over six and a half percent. They were around three and a half percent. So they've doubled. And the doubling of that interest rates and the massive increases in home prices since 2020 means that the average mortgage is the, by far, by far the highest in history. And the gap between the average mortgage and the average rent is by far the highest in history. This is an extraordinary opportunity. Show me a time going back the last 75 years where that gap was even close. Even in 2006, when you know uh, fundamentals were upside down, that gap was not this ridiculous. Every investor needs to understand what that means for the long-term and the mid-term future multifamily. So that's the first thing that I keep in front of my investors all the time. And there's you know, a million charts on the web that show you how to do that. You can grab them from my webinars or you know, just grab them from the web. That's the, 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 that's the first kind of data point that I you know, give people. The second data point that I love to talk with investors about is as an asset class, Multifamily was much smaller than office in 2002 and was even smaller than office by 2010. It's now double the size of the office asset class. And it's clear that it's gonna be triple or quadruple that size because the office asset class has extraordinary challenges, right? 20% of their customers have vanished. With multifamily, we haven't had any customers vanish. We're adding customers. Right. So what is happening is institutional money that always preferred the office asset class because their average tenant has a thousand times the money of our average tenant. Right. Because their tenants are companies. Um, those people are jumping into our boat. Right. They're not spending a lot of money right now because they see the prices of multifamily coming down. So they're patient. They're, they're waiting. They're not in a hurry. But from what I can see, roughly half a trillion dollars, that's five hundred billion dollars is moving over into the multifamily asset class over the next five to ten years. If all of that money comes in, let's say half of that money comes in, I'm, I'm wrong and it's not 500 billion, it's 250 billion, it would 
massively raise the values of multifamily five years from now. I think those kinds of trends are not reversible. You know, work from home is here to stay. Most companies have accepted that people will come in three days a week. Well, if their people are coming in three days a week, they're they're staggering them and using 20, 30, 40% less space. And so fundamentals are extraordinary at this point in time. And we have basically a generation of Americans, call them 20 million families, between 10 and 20 million families, that will never be able to buy a single family home. And you might say, yeah, but single family prices will decline. Show me any proof of that. We are 13 months into this crisis. Interest rates are at six and a half percent. Most markets in the United States have seen a three or four percent decline in prices. Why? Because multifamily is single family, unlike multifamily, 99% of those properties. So a, a very substantial percentage of all single family loans in the United States are 30 year fixed. They're locked in under 4%. So that market is rock solid. It has defied everyone's expectations of price drops with the exception of a couple guys that got it right. Everyone expected multifamily prices to drop a lot more. They're not dropping because people are just sitting on it and saying, I have a 30 year fixed loan, rents are high. I'm not gonna sell my property. So as a res re result, you know, the market's probably dropped from peak by 5%, probably drops another two or 3%, which means that it's net gain after the completing that drop is still a shocking 30 plus percent which means that 20 million American families will never be able to catch up. And where are they going to go? I mean, their choices are rent or buy. This is absolutely the most hideous time ever to buy a single family. No, Neil, as always, you know, as expected, you know, you drop a lot of nuggets here today. We appreciate you so much coming on the Real Estate uh, Cashflow Champs Real Estate Podcast. We're going to shift here slightly into the what we call a lightning round. And uh, just one or two questions we may ask uh, that's more lighter. Uh, one piece of advice that impact your life and how you think it may benefit others. Um, I think this piece of advice is, is relevant to the times today, right? And that is push yourself to be a contrarian, not just in your thoughts, but in your actions. I think there are lots and lots of armchair contrarians out there. And the advice that I got was, Push yourself and actually do the things that, that you know, don't make sense. And, and that requires you to be pushed outside of your comfort zone, right? The day that the Russian war started, Netflix announced that it was going to stop streaming in Russia. The next day, its price started to crash. And, you know, when the report came out, it showed that Netflix had lost 2 million customers. I went and looked in the fine print and I realized that all of those 2 million were Russian, right? And so once Netflix price had dropped 80% from peak, I picked it up and then I was able to sell it for about two and a half to three times the price in six months, right? So being a contrarian, you, you're scared because everyone's saying Netflix is, it's, its growth is slowing and Disney is doing this and, and, you know, so, and, and uh, the Apple is doing that. But I'm looking at Disney and Apple and realizing that all of them are losing massive amounts of money, billions of dollars, where Netflix is distributing cash. So I'm saying if a company that's, the, if the only company in this industry that actually distributes cash is 80% cheaper than before, and every other company that's spending money is basically losing billions of dollars, then this stock will come back up. Think that way and you will make a lot of money. That's awesome, that's awesome. Neil, you're such an accomplished man, and I'm so privileged to be talking to you today. What are some habits or just one habit that you, you, you practice maybe on a daily basis that you think contributes to the type of success that you had? Miracle morning. Um, I get up at five in the morning. I make sure that I do all of the pieces of the miracle morning, all six pieces, sometimes five, because I, I like to go to a Pilates club, which sometimes is in the evening. It really opens up my mind. And then I like to read and research in, in the morning, right? Get my research out of the way. So, you know, I, I subscribe to lots of bo both paid and unpaid, um, you know, data sources, Bloomberg, places like that. And I go in the morning and read them and that starts, starts to get me set. And then I, I also go and read a lot about real estate, Yardy Matrix, CBRE, Marcus and Millichap, and a dozen other sources. I go in and read, I make sure that I'm on their webinars and I usually watch them at 2x, so I don't watch them live. So that allows me to get through them in, in half the time and get you know more content. Those habits really help because 
you, you empower yourself with education and you make less frantic decisions. Just kind of curious, when you compile it for, for each day, uh, how much time you think you'd spend like reading, gathering this information, just to get the information going before you actually start your day in actual other work? Is that a half an hour? Is like an hour you spend on that? What type of timing? A half an hour before I start, but an hour in total. Give me a book or two, Neil, if you may, that you would recommend to either passive investors or, or even active investors that you've read that you think would be helpful. You know, if you're new to investing or new to real estate investing, I, I strongly suggest Rich Dad, Poor Dad, simply because the book is so easy to understand and so easy to keep with you, right? 10 years down the line, you'll still remember what, what he, you know, Kiyosaki is saying. I think that if you've been in it for a while, and you, you want to understand multifamily, just go to Amazon, type in multifamily or apartments. There's a number of books that uh, that have, you know, four stars, five stars, thousands of people reading it. Any of those books would make sense. Understanding the industry itself that you're investing in makes a lot of sense. So if you haven't read a book on multifamily and you've been listening to Prashant and Paul talk about multifamily and its benefits, then you're really missing out. I, I mean, you have to understand the market that you're in. Yeah, th just the last question, Neil. I mean, I know everybody can reach out to you. They, you, you. they can go to your website and reach out, go to your LinkedIn. But what are the ways how can folks connect to you and come, come to your funnel? I mean, give, us, give your, your contact information. The easiest way is to go to Multifamily University, which is multifamilyu.com. We do a number of webinars. They're stored there. You can watch those or register for new ones. We don't you know, charge for education, have no interest in, in doing so. You know, my boot camps, the business closed many years ago and, you know, will not come back. Um, and But that ecosystem of 20,000 people you know, working together, nurturing, learning together is a powerful ecosystem. So multifamilyu.com is a great place or you can choose to join my mission. My mission has changed. My mission has become, you know, I, it's called Mission 10,000. And my mission is to build 10,000 townhomes for Americans. Single family is beyond reach for me, for anyone else. Apartments are great. Many people are doing it, but people want to live in homes, not apartments. They live in apartments when they have to. So what you guys are up to is phenomenal. Keep doing it. The challenge is there's not enough people doing the middle piece, the middle America. And so my mission now is to build 10,000 townhomes for middle America and build them in smaller cities. So if that resonates with you, you know, send me an email, mission10,000. My email is neil at growcapitus.com, G-R-O-C-A-P-I-T-U-S.com. So check out my company, growcapitus.com. There's dozens of reviews there from investors and, and you can connect on that mission with me, both as somebody who can bring equity to the table or somebody that wants to invest with us. So there's, you know, projects that we are working on Right now is a wonderful time, by the way, because land is cheap and you can keep it in contract for 18 months. So I'm just delighted by the market out there.